data collection methods, interviews, questionnaires, and observation. The learning outcomes include we will look at interviews, questionnaires, and observation methods of collecting data. We will look at the advantages and disadvantages of each method. And we'll recommend some guidelines if you plan to use observation interviews or questionnaires in your research. First, we have observation. You watch someone or something or some issue, whatever it is, you watch, you observe, you see what happens. Of course, you need to make sure you observe at proper times, different times of the day, different people, and so forth. Interviews may be face-to-face, -face, which is very costly. Telephone Skype, not nearly as costly, but still takes a lot of time resources. Questionnaires, you can personally administer them to someone. It's almost, you can send them through the mail, but almost all now are electronically administered. Allows you to re reach a wide group of people very easily. However, you may not get a representative sample. You aren't there to look and see how they respond. There are some disadvantages as well. So let's start with observation and talk about one thing. Perspective matters. John Lubbock said, what we do see depends mainly on what we look for. So if we are looking for something, our perspective matters. That's one reason it's good to ask people who report to the person you're observing as well as who that person reports to getting a 360 view because we look different to others than we do to ourselves. As Lubbock said, in the same field the farmer will notice the crop, the geologist will see the fossils, botanists the flowers, etc. Though, though we may all look at the same things, it does not all follow that we should see them. We see what we're looking for. Perspective matters and we have to take that into consideration. For instance, a professor may be asked about a particular student. The professor notices that the student has been absent a number of times, that the student is reluctant to talk, that they missed one of the five homework assignments and things like that. So the professor may say, well, they're doing okay. The student, however, may say, I made four of the five assignments and did well on them. I did miss a couple of days and one assignment because I was ill. I didn't tell the professor that because we're in a large class and I didn't think I needed to, but I believe I'm performing well. So the same situation, two people in this case have different perspectives. So we need to ask people with multiple perspectives if possible. That does require more resources to ask more people, but it gets a clearer picture perhaps of what the truth is. Or as Lubbock mentions, perhaps the truth depends on who you are and what you're looking for. One way that observation has been studied was, is classical conditioning, which was first really reported upon by Pavlov. You probably have heard of Pavlov's dog. With classical conditioning, there's an unconditioned stimulus and an unconditioned response. So the dog sees food, and the dog salivates getting ready to eat. During conditioning, a bell may be rung at the same time that the food is brought out. And the dog may then come to associate the bell with food and may salivate even when the food's not there. 
because that's what happened after conditioning. So things can happen that will change how you observe people. By your observation, you're changing. The Hawthorne effect is another widely studied issue that comes up. Originally, back in the 40s and 1940s, they wanted to see if workers would perform differently when receiving more or less light. GE actually put on the study. And while the retests have shown mixed results, the original test showed that when you turned on the light and people knew you were observing them, they performed better. It wasn't the light being on, or it wasn't your observation, it was the fact that they thought they were being observed. So even when you turned the light on and weren't observing them, they performed differently because they thought they were being observed, much like Pavlov's dogs. What you see is people behave differently when they know you're watching them. Just by your being there, you change the way people behave. If they think they're being watched, they act differently. If I think I'm being watched, I'm going to make sure I've got on the right clothes that day and I have my hair fixed and I'm, I, I'm well rested and I smile, whereas normally perhaps I don't do that. Just by me knowing somebody's going to watch me, I will behave differently. You can look at a YouTube video that describes this effect in more detail. Interviews may be structured or semi-structured, unstructured. With structured interviews, you have a, a script, a set of questions you ask everybody. In the same order, you usually don't have a chance for open-ended responses. Possibly at the end you ask do you have any questions, but it's scripted, very structured. The interviewer is neutral, simply asking the questions. This is usually used when you already know something about the topic and where you want to go with it. In contrast, you might use semi-structured where you give the interview a guide of general questions, but the interviewer is free to ask follow-up or other questions based on how, they re how the respondent answers one or more questions. So the interviewer has a much more active listening and asking approach with semi-structured. You may use open-ended questions to allow the respondent to give you richer data. This is when you already know a lot about a topic, but maybe you're not quite sure where your research is going. You're leaving it open. Interviews are costly. They're resource intensive, semi-structured, or typically even more resource intensive, particularly if you have to use multiple interviewers. Each must be trained. You have to make sure that they're doing the same process. So these are costly, but give you richer data than simply observing or questionnaires. You can take a look at a couple of YouTube videos that do give you more information on structured and semi-structured interviews. Questionnaires are inexpensive. They allow you easy access to a lot of people. They have limitations. Oftentimes it's a convenient sample. You give the survey to the students, the people sitting in the room who may or may not be representative of the population you're hoping to get to answer, ask questions. Their self-reports, people lie. They don't know. Self-reports have inherent problems. You can't follow up. They answer the survey, they leave. There is a method bias simply by using a survey. People are conditioned how to respond. They often have a negative attitude simply because of the method used. And as I mentioned, it's often a convenient sample. You can take a look at a YouTube video on how to write a survey or questionnaire. Some guidelines. Make your question wording clear and unambiguous. Use appropriate language and reading level for the population that you're going to be surveying. 
use closed-ended questions, very, very structured questions, sub objective questions, as opposed to a lot of open-ended questions. They just, they take longer and that's not what people anticipate from surveys. You may want to use positively and negatively worded questions. So I studied a lot this week, I did not study a lot this week. Make sure you're, they're not ambiguous. For instance, um, I, I found the, the food and the parking fees to be um, unacceptable. You've asked two questions there, food and parking. Maybe one of them they like, one of them they don't. You don't get clear answers and you don't allow the respondent the ease of understanding what you're trying to tell them. Some other things to look at, social desirability. I may answer in a form that I think I should answer. So did I exercise three times this week? Absolutely. I should have. I intended to. Everybody else will. I don't want to look different. Make sure the questions aren't too long. Have a good sequence so it's a nice flow for the respondents. And usually ask the demographic information at the beginning or end and thank the respondents at the end. The appearance, you want to have a good introduction. You want to organize the questions in a logical manner that the respondent can follow. If there is personal or private information, ask that at the end so you get them to answer as many questions as possible. Open-ended questions, if you have them, don't have too many, but put them at the end and thank them at the end. To summarize, there are many ways to collect data. You may use direct observation with or without their knowledge. If it's without their knowledge, you may gather more true or more accurate data. But if it's without their knowledge and they find out, you may lose their trust. Interviews give you rich data at a, a cost of being resource intensive and not allowing you to have many respondents because it is resource intensive. Questionnaires allow you to reach a large group of people quickly and inexpensively, but the data is not as rich as other methods and the questionnaire method itself has inherent, um, inherent limitations. So each method has strengths and weaknesses. As mentioned, you have to decide what's appropriate for the situation that you have and try to get the best type of method of gathering data as appropriate for your situation.